Well, good morning. morning. Hope everybody's doing well and blessed this morning and uh, got to come in and uh, see the ladies tea just for a little bit yesterday. Heard the just a sweet time and fellowship and teaching. And uh, we have Michelle Randall is still here with us. And uh, we're very blessed to have her and, you know, her and her husband John in our lives. Uh, we've known them for many years, and, uh, but just real blessed by that. And, and also, just so you know, we have her book, uh, The Great Exchange, is on sale in the, at the back table. We're just selling it at cost. So, you know, get this. It's 15 bucks. Uh, for another $20, you can have it, her sign it. <laughs> for another $50, I'll sign it, too. And... Uh, We'll just go from there. No, I'm just kidding. So, but, you know, just, you know, want to encourage you to pick this up. Uh, all, every penny goes back to, to the, their ministry and stuff. So just want to encourage you. This is a way we support as well, uh, you know, those who come to, to bless and minister to us here. And, and, and I know you'll be blessed by this read, too. So I just want to get, put that out to you. And those will be for sale after the service on the back table. Buy the donuts. Pick up a donut. Buy a book. It's right there. Hey, let's open our Bibles this morning to the wonderful book of Ephesians, chapter 6. As we continue this verse-by-verse study, getting closer and closer to the end. I'm almost sad for it to end. Love this. been just a, such a great adventure. Ephesians, chapter 6. We're going to be honing in on verse 16 this morning, but let's start with reading uh, back at verse 10 once again to get this in the full context. Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Let's pray. Lord, as we once again come to open up your precious and powerful word, Lord, may you soften our hearts, Lord. May you set aside those thoughts in our minds by the power of your spirit to hear and to receive your word this morning. May you fill me afresh as I teach and preach your word, and may you receive honor now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, as we read through verses 1 through 18, uh, we are now to have been taken in a different direction. If you, you know, as we even synopsized last week, we now have our call to battle. We are now reminded and, and told who we are. Our mor- marching orders, in the words of Martin Lloyd Jones, have been given. And we've been, you know, told who we are in the first few chapters of this wonderful book. We've been told who we are, what we have in Christ. And then the next few chapters, we're instructed in different ways on how to live knowing who we are in Christ. And now we need to understand that because of who we are in Christ, we are now called into battle. Every single person here, whether we want to be in the battle or not, it's almost like you've been dropped in the middle of Afghanistan, in the hills, in the middle of hostile territory. You know, a lot of us want to go through our lives and we don't want to put on the whole armor of God. We don't want to think about warfare. I just just want my peaceful life. I just want to go to work. I want to come home. I want to have dinner and I want to have to do this and that. Amen? Sincerely, that's how we all can be. That's our natural flesh, by the way. 
We don't want to think about spiritual warfare. We don't want to think about those things because we like the comfort. We like the, the normality of our lives. But again, we now know about this battle. And notice, we were, we've been commanded over and over to stand, to withstand, to stand against the things, the evil things that are in the spiritual realm. But notice, we've been commanded to stand in the power and in the might of God. Can I have an amen? Amen. We don't stand in our own power and in our own might. And I don't know about you, but I am very thankful for that. Because if it was about my power and my might, I'd fall so much more than I do every day. But it's about the power and might of God. And notice, as we're to stand and we have this power and might of God to stand against the devil and his wiles, his methodologies in our lives. And to do this, we're then further commanded to put on the full armor of God. You know, we're not going to go out to battle. Oh, I, did, I left my sword back at the base, boss. I, lo I left this back. I, no way, man. You know you're going into battle. You're putting everything on. We're first told to, to put on the, to the belt of truth, to gird our loins, basically to hold up our lives, if you will, with the truth of God and his word. We're told to put on the breastplate of righteousness, guarding our hearts with the righteousness of Jesus Christ alone. We're then told to shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, standing firm in the gospel ourselves, and then moving forward, bringing the gospel to a lost world. And now we're commanded, look at verse 16, please. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now notice that we're first told, notice it says, above all. In the ESV, it says, in all circumstances. The NIV, the NASB, in addition to this. So again, this is something that is very important. It is, you know, one of the things of the utmost importance in our lives as Christians and in the battles that we're in every day, every moment of the day. And look back at verse 12 with me. As we stand against the principalities, the powers against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of the wickedness in the heavenly places, we now have our shield of faith that we hold and we bring with us. We take it up, holding forward. You know, the, the shield of faith, the shield for the Roman soldier back in the day, it was basically their first line of defense. And it was approximately, you know, some commentators would say it was four feet by two, others say four feet by two and a half, but it was a good size. And I went back and I looked, well, what's the average height back then? And, and it, with skeletons, the average height was probably 5'6", five, 5'7". Five, so they still, and even today, so it's not that much shorter. The average height today in America is 5'10". And so if you look around, you know, 5'10 is the average. And in a 4-foot, you know, uh, shield, you could hide behind that pretty well. Two and a half feet wide. Some of us may be better than others. <laughs> I'd like it a little wider for now. Prayer for thou continue to shrink and fit behind better. But you see, it was something that they, that they would, it would be their first line of defense as those things would come flying in. This is how one commentator described the Roman shield. He said it was very large, usually four feet by two, made of wood and then covered in toughened leather. And as the soldier held it before him, it protected him from spears, arrows, and fiery darts. Now here's the interesting thing too. Check it out. The edges of these shields were so constructed that the entire line of soldiers could interlock their shields and march as one into the enemy with a solid wall, he said. So again, think of the pictures that we are seeing here. I love this. You know, it's four feet in height, and so the average soldier could, could take, you know, refuge behind it as these things are coming at them. It would protect them, and again, that's what our shield of faith is meant to do, to protect us. And notice, when you hold a shield, you hold it out, almost at an arm's length, away from your body. It is taking the brunt of the force that is coming at them. But what I also love is that they can interlock their shields. 
And, you know, for me, what a great picture again. What a great illustration. The Lord is so great at illustrations and parables and pictures. But of the body of Christ, we are not in this battle alone. You know, it, it really saddens me and grieves me when I run into people. It's like, well, you know, are you a Christian? Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. You love Jesus? Yeah, I've been born again. Yeah, you repent of your sins? Oh, yeah. What church do you go to? Oh, I don't go to church, bro. It's like, well, dude, why not? Why aren't you going to church? Well, I, uh, I just I don't need it, man. I'm, just, I'm out here. I'm all right. It's cool. Or I've been hurt by the church. You know, there's a bunch of hypocrites there. They're, they're this or that. And it's like, well, yeah, then don't join because you'll be a hypocrite too. We're all hypocrites. We're all still sinners saved by grace. I don't come to church here to, you know, I'm not a sin sniffer. Oh, who's a sin sniffer? I come here to love and to stir people up to good works. I come here to use the gifts that I have to encourage you in your walk, but also to remember that we, we, as we come together, we are in the battle together. We, and as, as, the, as they would join shields, we join hands in prayer. And we get down and use that mighty weapon of prayer against the enemy in our lives, in other people's lives, in lives, you know, with our nation or the world. And we come together, we encourage each other with the word of God. You know, imagine being in a Roman camp. Hey, how's your sword? Let me, oh, dude, that's kind of dull. You need to get that sharpened up. Let's, let's get that sharp. Hey, how's your other stuff? Check my armor. Let's see how you're doing. Oh, hey, you got some cheeks here. We need to get this stuff fixed. And that's how it should be in the body of Christ. Looking out for one another, praying for one another, lifting up one another. And we're going to come more to this part at the end of the armor of God. But man, just what a great reminder that even as we see the shields and they were able to lock together. We need to remember that we have fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord that are in the battle with us. You know, just lastly on this little sidestep, the, the enemy wants you to think you're alone. You can I have an amen? He wants you to feel alone. He wants you to be alone. He doesn't want you here. He doesn't want you opening up your Bible. He doesn't want you on your knees before God in prayer. What does he want you? He wants you off, shuffled off to the side, away thinking, you know, just wounded and dark and feeling alone instead of coming and saying, hey guys, I feel alone. Could somebody pray for me? Instead of coming and dying to ourselves and loving on other saints and lifting them up even when we're still hurting and finding that in the midst of that, because it's better to give than to receive, God works in our lives healing us. It's like, hey, wait a minute, Lord, I came here to love and to serve. I know, Bill, but in the midst of that, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to pour more of myself into you, through you to others, because I want you to be that broken vessel, lifting each other up in the battle. Now notice, above all, here in verse 16, taking up, notice it's called the shield of what? Faith. Taking up the shield of faith. You know, this isn't just a simple Roman, you know, shield. This is a shield of faith, and it is of much more import. It is much more important, much more valuable than any other shield. You know, you, you read even in Solomon when he's decorating the temple and he's these, these shields of solid gold he's hanging on. That's, those are nothing. Nothing compared to the shield of faith. Faith here in the Greek is pisteos, from the Greek word pistis, and it literally means this, persuasion, credence, assurance, belief, faith, conviction of the truth of anything, a strong and welcome conviction. One Greek scholar said this, in Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen means that persuasion is not the outcome of imagination, but it is based on fact, such as the reality of the resurrection of Christ, and such it becomes the basics of a realistic hope. You see, our faith is not based on fairy tales. Oh, you people, you Christians, you just believe all this stuff, you just take it all by faith. As a matter of fact, I do. And I'm not ashamed of that, by the way. But there are evidences that we can lean on, that we can stand upon as well. The evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is basically irrefutable if you go by today's even legal standards. 
There was more than two witnesses to this event. As a matter of fact, there are hundreds that saw the risen Christ. And even when Paul wrote about that, he wrote about that saying, you can go witness, you can go talk to these witnesses. You don't have to just believe me. But we, there is person after person, hundreds of people that saw the risen Christ. That's just one thing, by the way. I want to talk about the archaeological evidence. By the way, it's almost by the day they are finding more and more stuff that is just radical things. That again, I don't like to say that archaeological evidence, you know, well, that makes the, that the Bible is true. It's like, no, no, the Bible says that those archaeological finds are true. And I really mean that because there's never been something found in archaeology that, that disrupts the Bible. Again, if anything, 100% of the time, it's the opposite is true. They just found, you know, this city that they believe is, is Sodom. And, and they, they, that it was, they were speculating that, you know, this meteor came from, remember these are secular science, you know, archaeologists, but the, the, the heat was such that it had to be some kind of blast that didn't hit the city, but it like blasted just above the city. And the heat was so great that it caused certain like plates and things to, you know, cr crystallize and turn into glass on one side, but not too deep, so it didn't actually hit. And so they're showing, telling all this evidence, and you're just like, yeah, I, I read about that already. God told me what he did. I'm, I'm, my hat's off to you for finally finding the stuff buried. You know, or like we were saying, Pilate, they just found his signet ring. They actually found it years ago, but they were finally able to decipher that it was a signet ring of Pilate. I mean, again, you can talk about prophetical evidence. And we can go back and talk about all the scriptures fulfilled here or there. But how about, again, we just point to Israel. A miracle in our day. And God predicted it over and over and over again throughout the Old Testament into the New Testament that he would bring them back together from all over the world. And by the way, he did this at different times through different authors. And he also said in two different places they were going to come back in unbelief. And guess what? They're in unbelief. And so again, you look, and that's never happened in the history of the world, ever. And we see Bible prophecy fulfilled right before our eyes. And again, it becomes normal in a way. Oh, what's the big deal? It's Israel, what? And it, it, it reaffirms our faith in the Word of God. Remember, God said, I've, I've told you these things from before so that you may know that I am God. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. But we need to understand this. So faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Again, it doesn't mean that it's based on, you know, ooh, let's just, these. no, it's based on realities. Now, one other commentator said this about faith. He said the faith mentioned here in, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, it is not saving faith, but rather living faith, a trust in the promises and power of God. Hey, you know, if I can encourage you, put that in your side notes on your Bible. Write it down. Put it in there. This faith is a trust in the promises and the power of God. Beloved in Christ, do you trust in the promises and the power of God this morning? I would make the case that a lot of us, maybe you're a newer Christian and you just, you've never really had that power. You, you never really had that faith. Maybe you're an older Christian. You've been through so much. Your shield is starting to get worn and tattered. And your faith is kind of lagging a little bit. Beloved in Christ, we need to trust in the promises and the power of God. Not in the circumstances of our lives. Not in what we've been through, not in what we're going through, not in what we will go through, but we trust in the divine power of God. His character as revealed through His Word. That's what we need to do. And again, I agree heartily with this guy. We, you know, again, we've already put on our breastplate of righteousness. Remember, that's the breastplate of righteousness in Christ that we have as every believer. We no longer have our own righteousness before God. We never did, as a matter of fact. It was all filthy rags, if you remember. But we have now stand righteous before God for all eternity, covered in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We're already standing with our feet shod in the preparation of the gospel of peace, meaning, again, we are already standing firm in our lives on the gospel of peace. 
And as we talked about last week, we have that peace of God ruling and reigning in our lives because of the gospel. Man, I tell you, these studies for me have been honestly just life-changing again. I love as we go through and things that I've studied for years, God just opens anew and afresh. And I pray he's doing that for you as well. No, this faith that we're seeing here in this shield is our day-to-day faith. As we walk and live as Christians, as we go into the world, as we live in our homes, as we're in school or we're at work or with our wives or husbands or our children or parents or friends or enemies even. It's a faith that we're walking in day to day, a walking in, in a living trust with God and his promises in his word. Do you have that this morning? As a Christian, you know what? It's available And there's a difference between picking up the shield of faith and not. You see, a lot of us, when we don't pick up the shield of faith, as we're going to see in a moment, we're hit with the fiery darts of the enemy all the time. And there's a lot of Christians I meet that are just like, oh, man, I'm just, how are you doing? Oh, I'm just terrible today. Oh, I'm just this or that. Or or there's things from the past that they're still dwelling on. Well, when did this person die? Oh, it's like been 20 years. Five years, eight years, you still hurt, but man, you need to stop mourning as the world mourns and, and, and walk in Jesus Christ. Put, start putting up your shield of faith. You see, faith believes that, it, that every word of God is amen and yes. Amen? amen? Faith believes that every word that God has spoken is yes and amen. And this faith believes that all the promises of God, all the words of God that we find here written in his word are true. And we find power here. We find refuge here. And we find the strength to move forward. And the it's a faith that says, because God said it, I believe it. I believe it above anything else anybody tells me. I don't care if it's a professor with 15 names or, you know, letters before her name and 15 letters after her name. Who cares? Again, beloved, I will take what God says above anybody here, above myself, above any pastor that I love and cherish. Hey, we may not always understand God's word, but we believe it. We believe it to be true. We we believe and then we walk in the powers. We hold it up by faith. You know, it's interesting. We all have faith in things. We all have faith in things. Even atheists practice faith. I think it takes more faith to be an atheist than it does to be a Christian. By far, I'll just be real honest with you. I mean, think about it. A lot of people's faith is in their own intellect, in the intellect of others. Some put their faith in their money. As long as they got the green stuff, you know, or can get it, man, their they're, they're faith and they're okay. Others put their faith in power. Some put faith in government, which is happening more and more within our country today. Some put their faith in their education, in the educational institutions. I'm telling you, the new pastors and preachers of our day are the university professors in the world. I'm telling you, they're the new religious teachers, if you will. They're the ones coming up with, well, what's politically correct? What's not? What's this or what's that? Still others put their faith in themselves because they can do anything once you put your mind to it. You can be anything, little Johnny, you want to be. When I wanted to be Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Dad. Well, you'll never be Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, but you can be anything else you want to be. You can be a Spud Webb, if you remember who Spud Webb was. He's a little shorter. We live in a culture, in a country, a society, even in a world that, that we lie to our children on a constant basis. Still others put their faith in themselves, or, and they put you know, their faith in, in their own works. We call this religiosity. Lord, I don't need your word, I don't need, and even a lot of Calvary Chapel people are, you know, evangelical, I, I don't really need to read the Bible, I, you know, I'm good with God, and I'm just going to go out and live my life because I got faith in myself, I can do it. And they fail every single time. Every single time. You know, as a pastor, I, when I counsel people, 
<laughs> people are funny. It's almost like, you know, when you go into a, a doctor's office and the nurse comes in, a guy or gal, whoever it is nowadays, and, well, I'm going to take your blood pressure. I'm going to take, you know, take your temperature, you know, do all this stuff. And, and, and they're doing all this stuff so they can get to the doctor. Well, when people come in to counsel me, I'll do the same kind of thing. It's like, well, hey, you know, before we get into this or that, let me talk to you about your walk with the Lord. You know, how, how are you, you know, how, how is your salvation? Tell me about when you got saved. Tell, tell me about your day-to-day -day walk with Jesus. Are you reading your Bible? What are you reading right now? Oh, yeah, I'm reading my Bible every day. Now they had this happen so many times. Oh, I'm reading my Bible every day. What are you reading right now? What did you read this morning? Well, I didn't get a chance to read today. That's okay. What did you read yesterday? Well, actually, I actually didn't read yesterday either. And sometimes, though, it's, it's almost like they're not trying to lie. It's just they're kind of almost fooling themselves. Well, what did you read the other day before that? Oh, I didn't. Gosh, you know, I, I, can't, I don't remember the last time I read my Bible, actually. You know. well, what about praying? Do you have a prayer closet? Or are you getting on your face before... No I, no, I don't. Do you ever fast? You know, Jesus said, when you fast, when you pray. Fasting, what's that? I don't know. I never do that. And you start talking to them about their relationship with the Lord. And, and, and it's just like, you know, what happens is they're putting their faith in themselves and not even realizing it. Maybe there are some this morning. Man, my, I see these Christians and they're kind of wacky, but they sure do seem happy. They sure do seem excited. They seem power. What, why, isn't, why, why isn't my life like that? Are you walking in faith with your God? I love the story of Enoch. One of the money, we hardly know anything about Enoch, but I cannot wait to meet him in heaven one day. Enoch walked with God, and he was no more, for God took him. That's how it should be with us as Christians. You know, Mary walked with God. Joe walked with God, and he was no more. So when you see Mary or Joe, it's like, hey, you, you seem so different, and, and I see Jesus so much more in you. Well, I'm walking by faith with my God. This is, it's an exciting thing. It's a, it's a real thing. We can put our faith in so many other things. Beloved, we need to put our faith first and foremost in the Lord in our day-to-day -day lives, put it into practice, in our day-to-day -day thoughts, in our words. You know, we, we take steps of faith all the time. Man, you take a step of faith when you got into your car this morning to come. Maybe some of you weren't rewarded and your car didn't start. You ever had that? Oh, man, I just, I'm turning, taking this. And not even a step of faith in God. That's just, you're taking a step of faith in technology. You take a step of faith when you pull your phone off the charger in the morning and boop, what's going on? Oh, see, it turns on. And that as you use that technology or that car, if you flick a light switch, you have faith that those things are going to work. And when they don't, we get upset. I paid money. What's going on? And we don't always understand how everything works. Can anybody here tell me how an iPhone works? Some of us could. Some of us couldn't. How about when you turn electric? Where, you know, okay, how, do you, how does the switch work? How does the light, how do they, and a lot, we use things that we trust all the time and don't understand. So how about we take that same heart of trust and, and put it in the Lord even more so. And, and walk with him, walking by faith day by day. You see, we can either be those who are walking in faith in ourselves, faith in the world, faith in my own whatever, my own beauty, my own money, my own power, my own strength, or we can be those who have faith and are walking with the Lord and believing in the Lord. Turn with me, please, to Jeremiah chapter, uh, verse, chapter 17. Jeremiah 17. I love this. Jeremiah 17, starting in verse 7. Jeremiah 17, verse 7. And if I were you, I'd be underlining these verses and circling them. Jeremiah 17, 7. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. That's the shield of faith, guys and gals. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when he, he comes. For its leaves remain green. It is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick or wicked. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. You see, beloved in Christ, we need to be those 
who are at, at, back in verse 7, those who are trusts in the Lord and who trust is in the Lord. In all circumstances, good news, bad news, terrible news, great news, God is still on the throne. And I will bring him glory. I will walk by faith. I will hold up my shield of faith. So again, now the question comes for each one of us, what are we placing our faith in in our day-to-day -day lives? Is it ourselves? Is it our own educations? Is it our work? I know a lot of people who put their faith in their job, their education, and, and all of a sudden when they lose their job, dude is, whoa, what happened? Their whole world falls apart and said, well, the Lord's on the throne. But you might lose your house. Yeah, it's his house anyway. Oh, you might lose this. Well, praise God. And I, I've been there. I know what it's like to go live in somebody's garage for three years. We have people come to our house now. We have two and a half acres. Like, wow, that's pretty nice for a pastor, you know. And wow, how do you, you know? God is good. You know, you wanted to see the poor bill. You should have came back, you know, and saw me when I was, you know, living in the garage and this and that. And I'm still the poor. I'm still, I'm the, the richest kid in the, in the block because I'm the child of the king. And I try not to hold on to those things too tightly. And it can be hard sometimes, amen? It can be hard not to hold on to our, well, our, our wealth. I don't really have that, but our health or, or our wealth or our children or our, you know, this or our house or our job. And we can hold on to those and we put trust in those. We put faith in those. These will keep me safe. My precious. You know, it's funny, I think that's what Tolkien meant with using that ring, by the way, as a precious. What's precious in your life? What, what do you hold on to instead of, here you go, Lord, it's all yours. That's faith. That's faith in taking a radical step in faith. You know, are we just wandering through our lives simply trusting in our own thoughts and, 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 and things? Are we trusting our own desires regarding this or that? My own ways of doing things? Well, this is how I've always done it, and this is how it'll always be done as long as I live. Man, I hope there's not one person here who says that except by walking with God. The only thing I want to be certain of is walking with God according to His Word. Everything else, Lord, it's yours. Even that, I'm yours, Lord. And again, we need to remember this and to have faith that the Lord, because he is good, he is pure, he is holy, everything that he allows into our lives is what? Good and pure and holy. And even if the enemy means to use it for bad, God turns it around and causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and those who are called according to his purpose. Ephesians 1 tells us he works all things according to his will. Not some things, not most things. He's never up there going, oh, dude, sorry that one got through, you know. Sorry, bro, I, I didn't mean. And no, God is complete. He is sovereign, and he is completely good. And when we have that faith that everything comes to me, and then, by the way, even the things that hurt, that God will never leave me nor forsake me. And again, I'm holding up the shield of faith. God doesn't love you. He allowed this to happen. No, I'm holding the shield of faith that says Jesus Christ died for my sins. God so loved the world. That includes me. I'm one of the sinners that he died for even while I was here yet sinner. And you hold up the shield of faith of the word of God. So again, are we living our way by faith in ourselves and the world? Or are we living God's way by faith in him and in his word? You know, to be honest, as Americans, it can be very easy just to kind of live in faith in our own stuff. In my own job, in my own work, in my own thing. Instead of, you know, Lord, what do you want from me? And taking everything, this is all yours. My time is all yours. The years I had ahead of you, had of me, Lord, are all yours. Maybe just the days. Who knows? They're all yours, Lord. What do you want? How can I take a step of faith today? And by the way, when's the last time you took a step of faith? Something that you couldn't do on your own. Well, I took a step of faith and I opened my Bible. Well, no. I took a step of faith and I gave a guy 20 bucks out of my pocket. I still had money left for my lunch, so it was all good. No. When's the last time you gave it all to somebody? When's the last time you, you, you detoured from driving somewhere with your groceries and just gave it to somebody the Lord gave you, told you to give it to? When's the last time? I'm not going to go on vacation. I'm going to go on a missions trip this year. When's the last time we did things that took faith? Well, they're going to think I'm stupid. We are stupid. Amen? 
We're all fools for believing in Christ. That God takes the foolish things of the world. I came to, you know, sense with that years ago. Okay, Lord, I'm a fool, and I'm, not, I'm proud of that. You know, Keith Green used to call it, I'm, I'm bananas for Jesus. And there are some here even, are you embarrassed of that? People know you're a Christian or this. I'm, dude, I got, I'm bananas for Jesus. Again, but are we walking in his way by faith in his word, day by day, holding up the shield of faith continually before us, holding up the word of God continually before us, his promises. You see, that's what we have faith in. We have faith in God. We have faith in his faithfulness, in his righteousness, in his word, those things that he's told us that he will do, who he will be to us. Now look back in our text. So above all, taking the shield of faith, which is, you know, with, with which, notice, you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the evil one. How many fiery darts can we quench with our shield of faith? All of them. Not some, not most. Oh, if you got through. We are able, God tells us here through his word, as we hold up this shield of faith to quench all the fiery darts of the evil one. Now, you know what's interesting? In these days of Roman warfare, and even, you know, you go back in history hundreds of years after that, they would do these fiery darts or just darts. And don't, don't think of like a wall dart, a little thing like that. Think of more anybody ever played lawn darts? get a big dart that's like this big and and so they would get these darts that are about this big and and at the end of them they would put some kind of pitch or something on them and then they would have a whole bunch of them in this thing and they would just almost like catapult them into the army that was coming at them and they would set the pitch on fire so as it went through just these flaming things would be coming you ever feel like that in your life maybe even right now Dude, all these flaming things are coming at me. I can't believe this. This is happening. Hold up your shield of faith. I always like to look at it like this. I'm holding up my shield of faith right here. That's the leather, by the way, on the outside. You see, and that's what they would take these darts, they'd light them on fire, and then they would shoot them at the enemy. And so basically they were looking at twofold. Well, really three. First to kill, to try to kill someone. But since it was, usually wouldn't go too deep, it might just usually just maim. So they would settle for maiming. But then they were hoping that the fire would catch something on fire. You see, and again, this is a perfect picture. The Lord could have said, well, you know, it'll extinguish all the, you know, fiery arrows of the enemy or the fiery spear. No, it's the darts. That are, and again, they're coming at us from all directions a lot of times, but we hold forth that, that shield and, and, and it, it, it holds back, it extinguishes all the fiery darts. And you see, some of those darts that the enemy wants to use to kill us, to kill our faith, to, to, to just to ground us to the ground. Other times, he just wants to wound you. And there are people here, I guarantee, that have been wounded in their walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, maybe by other Christians or professing Christians. I've met many people who have been hurt by churches and different things. And they're wounded. And man, I tell you, if you know what I'm talking about, there's like almost no other hurt. As somebody who's lost people close to me through death, getting hurt by the church, there's people in church that you love and trust, man, that's just almost as bad as losing somebody in death. But you know what the enemy loves? That dart hits you, and it starts to fester, and that fire starts to burn. You see, and then you're wounded, and you're out of service. They can't lose your salvation in that. It's not, you can't. You're, we're in the righteousness of Christ. Remember that. But you can be taken down. And what happens when somebody gets wounded in a battle? Usually there's a few other soldiers that stop to try to help. So all of a sudden, not one person is out of the battle, Two or three or four are out of the battle. And a lot of times that'll happen in a church. Somebody gets wounded, people come around, and all of a sudden this person, instead of you know, letting the Lord heal them, letting trust and putting up their shield of faith, they, all of a sudden all these people are kind of out of battle, just focusing on that instead of focusing on what we should be. Out there, sharing the gospel, giving people the words of life. And again, that doesn't mean that we don't help each other, which we do, but again, this is one of the things the enemy wants to do. And again, what a great illustration. He's shooting all these fiery darts at you. And he wants to tear you down. And again, not just tear you down, but cause it to start a fire 
and to, to, you know, it reminds me of a root of bitterness to grow, to continue to deepen. You know, these fiery darts, what are they? Dude, they would be like darts of fear that come into your mind or into your heart. Darts of, t- or darts of temptation or doubt or untruths. What about anger or bitterness or outbursts of wrath or lustfulness? These darts that come all continually at us. That's why the Lord tells us to take your thoughts captive. And by the way, when God tells us to do something, he enables us by his Holy Spirit to do it. And that's, again, holding up the shield of faith. I believe that. These are thrown at the Christian in our thoughts and in our hearts, hoping they will hit us and not our shield. Because, again, remember, our shield has a fire extinguisher built in. God, he extinguishes. Notice it says there, he extinguishes these fiery darts. They don't stay on, the, the, on, on our shield and, and remain on fire. They're extinguished. Why? Because when we have faith in the Lord and what he says through his unchanging word, far above anything that those false darts will say. Did you hear me? We need to believe and hold up our shield of faith in God's word, what he says about things, instead of believing those fiery darts. Hey, did you see what that guy did? He just cut you off. Well, who does he think he is? And that was a little dart that just hit you. Who does he think he is? He's a jerk. Hey, you jerk! Instead of holding up your shield of faith and saying, hey, you know, that guy's a jerk, but I think I need to pray for him right now. Or when the enemy tries to come in and light a fire, you know, he tries to hit you, to wound you, and say, your, your husband doesn't love you. Your wife doesn't love you. Your kids don't respect you. Your mom and dad don't care about you. Those are all fiery darts of the enemy. And by the way, they might even be true a little bit. They might have some rings of truth. But as we hold up the shield of faith, we extinguish them. doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about me because I am a child of the king. It matters what he thinks about me. You see, when, when, when Talia, like when we're, ma- we're married, when we were engaged, when, when we were even just going out, I thought about what does she think about me more than anybody else? Amen? I, don't, I, I, I was so in love with her, it's like, what does she think about me? I mean, I was just kind of the old surf bum kind of dude and wearing holy shirts and jeans that did, or shorts that didn't match, and my old Converse, you know, the shoes that my toes were hanging out, and I was pretty cool, actually, you know. It's like <laughs> but I didn't care what anybody thought. I, I still, for the most part, don't. But I cared about what my wife thought. All of a sudden, it's like, well, my holy shirt, maybe I better make sure there's not as many holes, or, you know, if she buys me a thing, it's like, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And since I'm colorblind, by the way, the, the outfit really didn't match in different things, and so now, I, you know, I let her dress me, you know, and so here, whatever you see, if you like it or you don't, you can talk to my wife, and <laughs> I'm all good. But here's my point. I was concerned with what she thought above anybody else. Do you like my hair, hon? Yeah. Anybody else? Ew, I don't like your hair. I don't care what you think. <laughs> she loves me. And it needs to be even more so, a hundred times, a million times more with the Lord. I don't care what anybody else thinks. I care about what my Lord says. And what he thinks because I'm so in love with him and again I'm putting faith in his word you are my beloved and my beloved is mine you read through the song of Solomon and you realize that it's like a picture of God Jesus Christ and his church and that's you his church and to see how much he loves you it honestly brings tears to my eyes right now because it's like that's how much he loves you that's how much he loves me but the enemy's coming in all the time. Don't believe that. Don't believe the word of God. This time of, of year, you know, happy holidays, happy holidays, happy this, happy New Year, no, but never Merry Christmas. I don't care. Merry Christmas, bro. God bless you. Oh, you can't say that. Yeah, I just did. <laughs> Put me in jail. And who knows, maybe it'll come to that. I don't care. We need to stop caring so much about everything else and start focusing by faith through at God through his word and again all these fires can come fires of fear fires of anger fires of gossip Tilly and I were I remember we read this one illustration years ago 
and we'll still bring it up every once in a while. There's fires. They'll have them out in the high desert. By Randy and Linda used to live out in Palm Springs area, and, and they would have these fires with some like out uh, in, in these forests, and it was so interesting because they would get the fires out, but what they didn't know is all of a sudden, a week or two later, it would spring back up, and they'd be back in the same area, and they'd put it all out again. It would spring back up just slightly over, and what they finally realized is the fire had gone down into the roots, and certain things would bring that back up, and all of a sudden, it would just come back out in the embers. And beloved in Christ, we need to come to the Lord and say, Lord, is there any fires burning of, of anger or bitterness or unforgiveness or even hurt that I haven't brought to you? And by faith, again, bring them to the Lord. By faith, bring them to the throne of God's grace. And find that forgiveness. And, and sometimes you might need to confess that sin to the Lord. Lord, I've been harboring this anger. I've been harboring this bitterness. I've been harboring hurt by what somebody did to me. Lord, I just want, I'm letting it all go. I'm coming to you afresh this morning. Remember, God's mercies are new every morning. And there's a reason for that, because we need them new every morning. Those fires need to be put out by faith. You know, it's interesting, looking back, Back in Genesis chapter 3, that was the first fiery dart of the enemy I saw. I'll just read it to you. You don't have to turn there. It says in Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God say? Hath God said? The first fiery dart was attacking what God says. And I guarantee you that every dart after then has been the same thing in one way or another. I love Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, you know, I have the whole scripture here. You can read it in Daniel chapter 3. You can jot that down in your notes. You know, King Nebuchadnezzar, he, he was so excited about himself that he made an image of gold. It was 60 cubits high, hundreds of... Oh, you know, like over 100 feet high and six cubits in breadth, and he set it on a plane in Derry, and he said, oh, when all the trumpets and everything sound, everyone needs to bow down and worship. Well, there was a few guys there that, you know, had hated the Jews, and they said, hey, you know, there's the three guys that you have put in power and authority and need named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and uh, they're not bowing down. They're not doing what you said to do. And, you know, so they attacked him, you know, maliciously. And, and it says there that Nebuchadnezzar was furious with rage. And so they brought these men before him. And now, you know, I'm going to give you one last chance, basically. We're going to play this music and you bow down and worship me. Worship the image that we've set up. And here's what they said to him. I, I love this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said, O King Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to, to answer you on this matter. We don't even have to answer you. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. Notice it's burning too. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, I love that. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we still will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. See, I love this. Their faith was not, they knew God could deliver him, them, but their faith wasn't predicated upon that. In other words, well, Lord, if you don't deliver me, I'm not going to have faith in you anymore. If you don't do all this stuff that I've heard promise that you're going to do, I'm out of here, bro. No, it's like, dude, for whatever, you take everything from us, our life. It doesn't matter. We're not going to bow down to your false gods. We're not going to do that. Because we know he can deliver us if he wants to. Oh, dude, Nebuchadnezzar it says he was filled with fury. He stoked that fire so hot that even the guys that were stoking the fire died. And so, he, you know, he had this fire, and he throws them all in, the three guys in. And all of a sudden, it says, he looked in, and he was astonished. Verse 24 of that chapter. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Hey, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? And he answered and said to the king, True, O king. And he answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire. They are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of God. <laughs> and I love this. King comes to the, you know, 
the entrance of the door, and he's all, hey, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. <laughs> now he's like changing. Come on out here. And he goes on to say, man, now everybody, your God is definitely true. But you know what? There are times when God would say no. There are times when, they, when, when the Lord, as you read through the Old Testament, they were burned up or they were put to death or they were tortured or whatever. You see, I, I just see this as a perfect picture of our lives, guys and gals. We need to be holding up that shield of faith the same that they did. And again, I love going through, you know, reading Hebrews, the, the hall of faith. And as you go through and you see that, that, that there, what was their faith in? It was always in the Lord their God as revealed to them through his word. And that's where our faith in our, the shield comes in. And as those fiery darts are coming, and I, and I firmly believe that this world as it's getting darker and darker, those darts are going to come more and more. And more and more. That's why we need to become stronger and stronger, deeper and deeper. Not just men and women who know the word of God, which we need to first and foremost, but then people who believe it, have faith in it. You know, and it's like you take, the world comes in and says, hey, donut shop or hey, cake shop, you're not going to make, you know, a cake for these people. We're going to shut you down. I'm not changing. I know my God can deliver me from this, but even if he doesn't, I'm still not going to bow down. And they take everything away and be, oh, it's so terrible. And it is. But our faith needs to be in the Lord. Our trust needs to be in the Lord our God. Above all, taking the shield of faith. You know, it's interesting because we, we see that those darts were thrown. Even Jesus, when he went out, he was led by the Holy Spirit out into the wilderness. And the, the, the devil came to him and, you know, and was tempting. Hey, if you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. I, I know you're hungry. And Jesus said, and I love this, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And the devil goes two more times and he starts trying to twist scriptures himself. Well, it is also written. You can almost see that little, yeah, it's also written. And Jesus answers, it is written. And again, Jesus answers, it is written. If the Son of God says it is written, beloved, how much more should we? It is written. When the enemy comes in and tries to, to deceive you, you're no good. You need to kill yourself. You need to just go. This world is dark. There's nothing for you. You're being hit by the darts of the enemy, beloved. Hold up the shield of faith and see how valuable you are in Christ. Remember even Paul the Apostle that came to a place where he said, man, I despaired, despaired even of life itself. And he basically did what David said, and I'm paraphrasing again, but he basically said, hey, why are you cast down, O my soul? Hope thou in God. Because it goes on to say, but I put my trust in Christ. I put my life in him. And beloved, we need to be those as we're holding up our shields of faith, that we're doing it as we're holding up the word of God and we're believing what God's word says. And again, again, in these last days, as we have all the prophecies that are being fulfilled left and right, as we see, you know, the return, the eminent return of Jesus Christ, the rapture of the church is drawing near. We don't get afraid, we get excited. And we get more and more about our Father's work. And we're ready for the coming of Christ. We're ready for him to come. And we don't get afraid. Why? Because my trust is in him. I put up my shield of faith. And it doesn't mean, you know, Bill, you're, some, you're a wacko, dude. You're a nut job. Well, I might be anyway, so that's all right. But I'm telling you what, this is, it, it's, it, a lot too many Christians have allowed their, their selves to, to not hold up the shield of faith and they're getting hit left and right. Well, you can do this little sin. It's not a big deal. Just let it go. That's a dart you just got hit with. And guess what? That's a little fire that's going to keep growing. And that sin will keep growing and growing. No, you need to get rid of it. You need to confess it. You need to repent of it. Because our Lord Jesus said, can't you, you know, through uh, John, confess your sins he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness hey as we're closing two things real quick number one we need to be continually strengthening our shields interesting well bill how do we do that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god 
you know, we were talking with Michelle last night, it just about, hey, you know what? We need to be not just reading the Word of God, studying the Word of God, but hiding the Word of God in our hearts. And, and, and again, being prepared for every situation when temptations come up, when friends say, hey, come get high with us. You know the scripture that says, hey, those who practice such thing will not inherit the kingdom of God. Come get drunk with us. Oh, you know, we're going out for beers and brews. Hey, come and do this. Come and do that. Well, this is what God's word says. We hold up the shield of faith. Now, there's going to come up when we're talking about the sword of the spirit. That's a different use of the word of God. This is where it's just a shield that shields us. From the attacks. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Start to stand upon the word of God like you've never done. Beloved in Christ. Strengthen your shields. And the last thing to do is we also need to test our shields. You know, we're told by Paul to, to, to test yourself. Um, Second Corinthians, turn with me please real quick to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians 13. Starting in verse 5. Test our shields. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless you indeed fail to meet the test? I hope you will find out that we have not failed the test. You see, we strengthen our shields as, you know, we are in the word of God, as we are walking by faith in the word of God. And we also test our shields by testing ourselves. Where am I at in my faith? Try me, O God, and cry out to the Lord. Lord, show me even in that. Is there any wicked way still within me? Maybe your shield is broken down a little bit. Maybe it's worn down. It's time to bring it back to the master and have it repaired and made brand new. You see, it doesn't matter if you're young in the Lord, if you're old in the Lord. We need to be standing in the power and the might of God, putting on the full armor of God. And again, may I encourage you this morning to to learn and to use and to hold up your shield of faith so much more in our lives. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, as we study about faith, Lord, and man, what a study we could do. And we look at the great saints of old, Lord, and though none were perfect, those men and women, and how we can relate, Lord. And I pray that we would see their lives, that we would learn, but we would also walk in trust and in faith with you that we would disappear, Lord, more and more as we stand more and more upon the solid rock of you and your word, Lord. And I pray for each one here this morning, Father, may you pour forth your Holy Spirit in mighty and radical and new ways in each person's life here, no matter where they are with you, Lord. I pray, Father, for those here who have never repented of their sins and believed on you to be the Lord and Savior of their lives. Lord, may they do so this day. Lord, we pray for the prodigals, Lord, those who have walked away or maybe just kind of slipped into a slumber in their walk with you. Would you awaken them this day? Would you call them back, Lord? Would we be those who are redeeming the time, Father, for your redemption draweth near, Lord? Father, we lift up the church as a whole, Lord God, to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.